On the evening of the 21st of September 1788, two Austrian military formations came across one another, and in a horrific moment of friendly fire, they proceeded to begin to slap each other silly. The high levels of friendly fire caused a bit of a panic to the Austrian baggage train, and led to an Ottoman victory. This accident occurred because the Habsburg Empire was such an ungodly abomination of about 73 countries in a Germanic looking trench coat, that the troops didn't speak the same language, and mistook each other for the enemy. The moral of the story is that sometimes friendly fire occurs, and more often than not, provided you aren't some kind of silly officer who isn't liked by his soldiers, it is due to miscommunication. Today's story is very much all down to miscommunication. Like, comment, subscribe, and let's get on to it. First things first though, and no, this isn't a sponsor read. I want to give a shout out to Anna. You may have heard of her on the website formerly known as Twitter by the handle of Ukrainian Anna. She's currently doing a bit of a fundraiser to help the guys in the AFU with chargeable battery packs. Both Hard Thrasher and I, along with many of your other favourite YouTubers, think she's pretty damn awesome, so link in the bio if you can lend some support. Every little bit helps. Even just sharing the link will help. Thank you all in advance, you absolute legends, and I will now continue with the funnies. Operation Viking. Now, it may shock a few wearaboos, but the German warships in World War II were not that special, and in some cases, flat out not that good. The only reason they were even marginally successful in large surface raids is due to the existence of the Italian Navy, keeping Britain very much occupied and, well, a lot of sheer dumb luck. But once the British had gotten their proverbial together and pulled the finger out, surface raids became less and less possible. But in February 1940, this wasn't the case, and the Kriegsmarine was engaged in a kind of warfare centred around the strangling of British imports attacking trade and civilian vessels, and avoiding any major engagements with the Royal Navy, of which they would most likely definitely lose. The panzer ships Lutzau, Admiral Scheer, and Admiral Graf Spee were ranging far from home and destroying as much as they could, trying to avoid the en masse Royal Navy in Europe and the powerful cruiser squadrons following them. These immensely powerful ships, often incorrectly referred to as pocket battleships, were able to overwhelm convoy escorts such as HMS Jarvis Bay, but if it came to it and they ran into a cruiser squadron, these expensive vessels would not survive. Isolated and sunk, the Graf Spee went down in 1939, and this same fate would later befall the Bismarck. But closer to home, the Kriegsmarine had many destroyers and many smaller torpedo boats that they wanted to put to good use. The German destroyers were criminally underrated in my opinion, and the focus of our story today is the first destroyer flotilla of the Kriegsmarine, which was made up of the first and third destroyer divisions. The ships included in this little fleet were the Friedrich Eckhold, acting as the flotilla leader, Richard Bateson, Eric Kuhlner, Theodor Riedel, Max Schultz, and Lebrecht Maas. They were all of slightly different mid-1930s vintage, and generally speaking, each ship was armed with up to five 5-inch guns, and up to two quad torpedo launchers apiece. So they were in all respects pretty damn strong ships for their size. They weren't exactly chomping at the bit for Wunderwaffe, but at the same time, they weren't anything to sneeze at. Now, for anyone who knows anything about how the Nazi state operated, you'll know exactly what I'm about to say. Power within the Nazi state relied a lot on showing off just how big your gentleman's sausage was. The Reichsmarschall Goring attempted this a few times with hilarious results, such as the Battle of Britain, and a very successful airlift to supply those troops stuck in Stalingrad. The sycophantic cabinet required this kind of showboating, and if you pulled it off, your service would get money and new toys. The Kriegsmarine, though, suffering from the pain of never being listened to and being thrown into a war and told to fight the Royal Navy in 1939 with the naval equivalent of two sticks and a particularly sharp rock against an autocannon, had to just make do with what it had. And what it had led them to the fantastical decision of sending all their vessels out piecemeal to get bonked, when in reality, had they kept them together as fleet and being, they might, might, have stood a bit more of a chance. But Nazis got a Nazi, so you know, funny boat times ahead. And that brings us to the infamous date, the 19th of February 1940, when the six destroyers I mentioned before put to sea. The idea was that these ships would disrupt the British trawlers around Dogger Bank, who Gross Admiral Eric Rieder suspected of engaging in a cheeky bit of espionage. Rieder thought that these trawlers were actively looking for gaps in the minefields that Germany had laid to defend the approaches to major ports such as Wilhelmshaven, and it was possible that there may have been some submarines in the area. It is safe to say that these quick and heavily armed destroyers were perfect for this role. A mad dash into the sea, a bit of shooting, and then back to port all under the cover of the Luftwaffe, and within a few hours sailing from home should anything very large and full of lager and slightly annoyed British seamen appear from the north. But it was time to Nazi this shit up, and if you're a follower of Lord Hearthrusher, which you should be, 
You'll understand just how special the Nazis could be at taking something that makes perfect sense and should be simple and just royally screwing it up. To understand why this horrific event occurred, we need to understand how both sides were operating. I have just explained the relative logic behind the German admirals and their applied strategy, but for the life of me, I know quite honestly shit all about the Luftwaffe's coastal patrol. Thankfully, I do have access to the aforementioned not quite peer of the realm, who has an ungodly level of knowledge on how the zooming things in the sky called planes with funny pinwheels on them work. So like all true venture capitalist pig dogs, I outsource this next bit. In many countries during the interwar period, the nice chaps with their flying machines had struggled somewhat to explain to sceptical army commanders why they should be granted independence. In Britain, the answer was, look at my shiny strategic bombers. Well, yeah, if you want to know how that goes, I have some videos, but we can summarise it as not at all well. In the United States, it actually failed completely and was still part of the army at the outbreak of war. In Nazi Germany, however, the answer was Goring saying, have you seen the size of my baton? And for wholly political reasons, the Luftwaffe got to be the Luftwaffe and not, no, I don't know, the Sky Hair or something. However, the Luftwaffe general staff were, almost without exception, former army commanders. And this meant that it was set up and designed to support the army as basically kind of flying artillery. Hence things like the Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber, beloved of Nazi propaganda films, Ernst Udet and the History Channel executives trying to make cheap documentaries. However... Eventually, if you advance far enough, your army will be confronted with something which has befuddled and confused generals for thousands of years. And it was, of course, the sea. And for sea stuff, you need a navy, at which point everything changes and goes horribly wrong. Supporting a navy from the air is quite a different prospect to supporting the army. I mean, first of all, the sea is miles and miles and miles of absolutely fuck all. I mean, there's probably dolphins and herrings and shit in it, but flying above it, your navigation has to be really bob on or else you're going to run out of fuel and die sooner or later. Also, everything keeps moving all the time, so ships you saw going 15 knots four hours ago will be 68 miles from where you last saw them and potentially might have changed direction completely just to fuck with you a bit. Worse, from a plane, basically anything bobbing around on the sea is what we aviation types like to call a target. But apparently, if you don't carefully measure the size of their guns, the Navy get frightfully upset and offended if you mistake one kind of gunmetal grey thing for another kind of gunmetal grey thing. It's all a bit Freudian, if you ask me, and a bit weird, and every single naval discussion sooner or later results in somebody bringing out a tape measure. Trying to spot whether the target has bigger or smaller guns, or how many funnels it has, takes practice, especially if the target is shooting at you. This is why Britain had coastal command, for example. And throughout the Second World War, literally every air force got it wrong on a repeated basis, often at absolutely critical moments. And of course, all of that requires your higher command to be playing nicely with one another. And this is, well, this is Nazi Germany, so that's not going to happen. They'd rather slam their hands in car doors than cooperate. So, for example, there was a shared frequency which the Kriegsmarine and the Luftwaffe had, but no one was using it or monitoring it. There was a means of telling one another about their operating zones, but they hadn't used that. There was a system of flares, but everybody forgot about it. There was a system of lights, but the Kriegsmarine weren't using it. And the Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe both felt that they should have control over the North Sea, so it was always going to end brilliantly. Basically, flying coastal patrols takes practice, interforce training and experience, and in February of 1940, two KG-26 had none of those things. They'd only just started doing this sea stuff a matter of weeks ago, and before that, been posted to Poland, where they got extremely good at dropping bombs, something that about 600 Kriegsmarine sailors were about to find out. Oh, yes, uh, one more thing. If you're flying over the North Sodding Sea in February of 1940, there is a 65% chance that any military boat that you see belongs to the Royal Navy. And they are not, say, I don't know, Japanese torpedo boats. Oh, wait, sorry, that's a, that's a different video by History of Everything. I, I, better, I better hand you back before I confuse everybody. Thank you very much, my right side up friend. Now, please get out of my house and stop trying to steal my book collection. Empty your bag on the way out by the door. Jenkins has to empty his bag, too. But yes, it was night time. The ship's motoring out, and they were not using the communication methods that they were supposed to in order to let the Luftwaffe know that there was something other than the Royal Navy bobbing about. The funniest part of all of this is they had actually requested air support from the Luftwaffe for the 23rd of February to Flieger Corps X. But when the Luftwaffe responded by going, yeah, okay, but why? Do you have destroyers out or something? The Kriegsmarine sort of just ignored them. For reasons. I don't know the reasons, nobody really does, because Flieger Corp X had sent multiple signals asking for clarification. That is strike one. Due to their speed, the ships began to make quick headway into the minefields on their way to Dogger Bank, but along the way things became, quickly, a little obvious that everything was not in fact going well. The Luftwaffe had sent out a couple of squadrons of HE-111s to disrupt British trade, no, not to help the destroyers, of which they had been requested to help because the Kriegsmarine never actually told them 
what they'd be doing. No, they planned their own mission for that night, and while they did tell the Kriegsmarine, the Kriegsmarine again just put its fingers in its ears and went, la 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 la, I'm not listening, and told nobody. Not even the destroyers it had just sent out. So that is strike two. The Kriegsmarine then decided to actually reach out for some help to the, with the Luftwaffe for scouting. But they reached out to a different part of the Luftwaffe, who had no idea that the HE-111s were in the air, and they weren't in contact with them. The Kriegsmarine now finally requested help from the Luftwaffe to have air support for the ships on their homeward journey for the following day. The wheels began turning in the commander of Flieger Corps X's head at this point, and he had a bit of a bolt to the brain realisation moment and a moment of clarity that went, oh crap, if they're asking for help on a return, that means they are out there now with our bombers. So quite nervously, he goes to the Kriegsmarine and he asks, you know, are there any destroyers out there this time? The Kriegsmarine, funnily enough, actually responding this time, turn around and go, yeah, why? That is strike three. It was a little late, though, because the planes and the ships were going to meet at night without knowing each other was there. And as I mentioned, it's nighttime, so it's dark. And no, the Kriegsmarine didn't bother to radio the ships that there were friendly planes in the sky and to tell them maybe, I don't know, don't shoot them. Meanwhile, back with the fleet. A lone bomber proceeded to notice a wake and a shadow, and the bomber followed this wake and flew over a ship in the dark. The flotilla was now below this aircraft, and three of the vessels, recognising that it was in fact a German aircraft, held their fire. The other three, though, well, they started blasting. The bomber was naturally a little pissed off at this and started shooting back. An officer on the bridge wing of one of the destroyers noticed a big black cross on the plane's underside wing and told everyone, hey, maybe stop firing, it's a German aircraft. He was promptly ignored. The bomber began to climb into an attack position before dropping its payload and striking the Liebrecht mass, forcing her to signal for help. But it was in vain, as the bombs fell again, tearing the ship in half with a massive explosion. Friedrich Eckhold, the flotilla leader, sent a message to the flotilla to send boats to help the crew of mass, and then the general idea was that they would continue with the mission. But don't worry, it's about to get a lot worse. Panic ensued, and the destroyers broke formation in a rush to get back to Liebrecht mass. Out of nowhere, the Max Schultz just detonated. Yes, that's right. Kaboom. Out of nowhere. Likely accidentally running into a friendly mine. The crew of Theodore Rydell didn't realise that it was a mine, and there is some conjecture today as to whether it was a mine or not. Most likely it was, given the location and lack of British reports claiming a kill, and they started just dropping depth charges everywhere. But given that this operation was beyond curse, they naturally didn't prime the charges correctly and they detonated under the destroyer jamming the rudder and putting it into a never-ending circle. On that, it's possible that it was a British mine, it's possible that it was a German mine. Likely was a German one, but there is a possibility that it was a British one just based on reports of British mining operations at the time. The survivors from the Mars, still in the water in February in the North Sea, were bobbing around slowly, freezing to death, while their comrades shot at an enemy that wasn't there. For the lucky few survivors who had managed to get into a boat towed by Eric Kulner, Things went from bad to worse as the destroyer accelerated to flank speed and flipped the boat, killing everyone on board. In the space of half an hour, everything had gone wrong, and the four remaining ships went back to port. Two destroyers were sunk, one was damaged, and 606 crewmen were dead. The German destroyer fleet didn't go to sea again until Operation Vesperin in April, that's the invasion of Norway. And the fiasco was honestly such a cluster that nobody could figure out exactly who was responsible. And so, well, nobody was punished. Well, except the 606 dead crew. They didn't exactly get away with not being punished, but yeah. Of the 22 destroyers that Germany started the war with, and keep in mind these are quite large destroyers, comparatively speaking for the time period, she lost 12 in 1940 alone. Granted, three more joined the fleet in 1940. However, she lost 12. It wouldn't be until mid-1943 that Germany would again field a destroyer force of at least 22 ships. So I just want to put that out. For a period in 1940, due to these losses, Germany had to cover a coastline from Norway, the top of Norway, all the way down, and then afterwards, after the fall of France, before all these ships started joining the fleet, all the way down to Spain, with 10 destroyers. It wasn't going to go well. So all in all, it was a tremendous British victory. Operation Vikinger, tremendous British victory, decisive even. Okay, that's
that last bit's a joke, but you get the picture. I want to say thank you to Hard Thresher for helping me out with this one. Subscribe to his channel, he's bloody hilarious, and if you can, please do help Anna out with her work. I personally would appreciate your support greatly, and I know the guys who do need these battery packs would appreciate it too, along with all of us. Like, comment, subscribe, join the Discord, Patreon link in the description, and I will catch you all next time.